Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday uh, night, uh, this Memorial Day weekend. And uh, I hope that last week was a, a blessing to you. We've been talking about stewardship, and uh, we're going to continue to uh, talk about that subject here in our Sunday evening Bible study. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, then we'll get started. Father, we do indeed thank you, Lord, for uh, the word of God that so clearly teaches us, Lord, about tithes and offerings and, and gifts to the Lord and how we are to give of our time and our, our talent and our treasure, Lord, and our testimony. And I just pray, God, that you'd help us as we talk uh, tonight and we take a lesson from the Old Testament uh, concerning, Lord, uh, stealing from you. And I pray, God, that we none of us would would ever be guilty of that. But, Lord, I just pray that you would just uh, help us, Lord, uh, to be honest in our dealings, especially when it comes to our tithing and offering. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter number 7. Joshua is probably my favorite Old Testament book uh, to teach from or to preach from. A lot of good life lessons uh, are in there. And, uh, and I hope that, that each and every one of us would uh, uh, be able to um, learn from that. I'm going to turn my watch off real quick. It's dinging and stuff up here. I know you guys probably can't hear, but it'll drive me crazy And uh, in that. So Joshua chapter number 7, we're going to pick up right where God is talking to Joshua right after a major victory, but also a defeat for the children of Israel. Listen to the word of God as we begin. Joshua chapter 7, verse number 10. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing, and, they also, and have also stolen and dissembled also, that they put it uh, even among uh, their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their back before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thou uh, hast said, <coughs> Excuse me, for thus saith the Lord of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before the uh, before thine enemies until ye have uh, till ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and ye shall and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the families which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing uh, shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he had transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he hath uh, wrought folly in Israel. Now, we are talking about stewardship. And we'll, we'll get back to this lesson in just a moment or this passage of Scripture. But we need to remember some things about our stewardship. Number one, we need to remember that a steward is someone who manages everything that they have for their, for their master. But the, he himself, the, the steward, really owns nothing. But they are responsible to be faithful to the master. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, it is required in a steward that a man should be found faithful. Notice it says required. It doesn't suggest uh, that, uh, that we're good stewards or, or, you know, if you have time or if you think about it, it says it's a requirement. It's something that we are, are called to do. Now, none of us were forced into stewardship. When we became, uh, we became stewards, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. Now, uh, the price that he paid for us to be his child was his very own blood. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 tell us this. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood 
of Christ as a lamb without spot, excuse me, without blemish and without spot. And so something very precious was given for us in order to be saved and us becoming, being saved and becoming God's child, then God starts to give us blessings that we are to steward for him. Now, because we are stewards, we are held accountable uh, for how we use our time, for how we use our talent, for how we use our treasure, because each and every one of these things affects our personal testimony. People watching our lives, uh, uh, seeing how God is using us. It's a, our daily personal testimony. Uh, people watch each and every day around us. Now, in our opening scripture reading, we read about a crime that was committed uh, among the children of Israel. Someone has stole something that belongs to God and hid it among their stuff. Now, the story really begins in Joshua chapter 6 with God giving Joshua orders uh, on how he was going to give the Israelites a victory. Go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter number 6, if you would, just a kind of a page over probably in your Bible. And, uh, and we'll, we'll read here in just a second. Now, God was going to help these people as they went up against this fortified city of Jericho. But because this was the first city, this city was going to belong uh, to God. Now, uh, look with me, if you would, at verses 17 through 19 of Joshua chapter number 6. And uh, it says this, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Now, this word accursed here, uh, used in here, means dedicated to. Or it's going to be given to the Lord. Everything that was in Jericho was going to belong to God. It says, it shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. Remember, she's the one that hid the, the two spies. She and all of her, uh, she and all that are with her in the house because she did hit, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep uh, yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourself accursed. Now this word accursed here means doomed, means doomed. And, uh, and so if you take that which belongs to God, you're bringing judgment upon yourself is, is what they're saying uh, here. Now, <clears throat> and uh, not only that, but when ye take of the accursed thing, it goes on to say here, ye make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. So what's going on here? Well, uh, we were, they were warned uh, going into this thing that they were not supposed to take of the accursed thing. They were warned by God uh, not to do that. But something happened. Uh, or, and God said one more thing. I forgot verse 19. It says this. It says, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are concentrated, dedicated unto the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So they couldn't take anything from there. They were just supposed to go in, destroy the city, destroy all the people, but all the spoils of war in this first city were going to belong to God. Now, every Israelite understood uh, the first of everything belonged to God. They knew it from Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, when they were getting the law, which says this, and the first of the first fruits of the land that shall bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Now, with this being the first city, everything was going to be dedicated to God. Everything was going to, um, was going to belong to God that was there. That's, that's what they were saying. Now, they were going to defeat some other cities. And God was going to, after this city, allow them to take, as we call, the spoils of war. But this city, because it was of the first fruits, God said, this is going to be a curse. This is going to be dedicated unto me. Don't doom yourself. Don't doom the children of Israel by taking of the things that are dedicated to God. Now, in uh, uh, chapter, uh, the end of chapter uh, uh, 6, verse 27, says this, And so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. 
Well, before Joshua ever even got there, according to Rahab, the people were basically shaking in their boots. They feared because they had heard about the things that God had done uh, for them. And here, um, uh, if you were to read the rest of uh, chapter uh, 6, you would see that God gave them a great victory. Uh, that he caused the walls to fall down and they were able to rescue Rahab and they were able to, uh, to do so many things uh, the way God said and, and God gave them great victory. And because of that, because of this first city, this, this undef- the, the, this, um, the city that was supposed to be uh, undefeatable was defeated by God and the children of Israel, uh, uh, the people were shook in their boots. Now, in Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 though tells us this. There's a conjunction there that says this, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan took of the accursed thing. I skipped all of the people that he belonged to. uh, 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 Took of the accursed uh, thing. And listen to this. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Did God not give them fair warning? Yes, he did. And guess what? One man thought that, hey, you know what? It's not going to matter. Nobody's going to notice what I do. But Joshua and the rest of the children of Israel had no idea that Achan had sinned. They had no idea that somebody had taken uh, of those spoils. Now, they did find out through a defeat over a much smaller city, Ai. As a matter of fact, that defeat cost the lives of 36 men. Husbands, fathers, sons died as a result because somebody took what belonged to God. Now, the defeat cost uh, these lives and because one man decided to disobey. Now, can you imagine what he must have been thinking? He may have said, hey, no one's going to notice me. No one's going to notice me taking some silver and gold that belongs to God. I don't think he'll notice either. I mean, he's too busy helping us fight this thing. You know, this, this, this one little garment, this wedge of gold, this, this silver, and nobody's going to notice. But he was wrong because God noticed. God noticed. And can I tell you something? There are people that belong to our church, that belong to, to good churches all across this country and all around this world that are just like Achan. Instead of doing their part in stewardship, they're taking the things that belong to God and putting it among their stuff. And when they do that, they rob the church, not just the church building that we're in, but they rob the church, the people, of blessings that God could be using uh, to further the gospel. So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. What's among your stuff? What's among your stuff? So let's ask a question. Where do we get our stuff? Where do we get our stuff? I mean, I'm a blessed man. I'm a homeowner. I have a house. I have a car and a truck. I'm blessed. I have a wife. I have children inside of my house their stuff you know I, I don't live in the, in the richest part and neither do I live underneath an underpass I am a very blessed man when I sit in my home and I look at my stuff whether I'm sitting at my kitchen table or I'm sitting in uh, my, uh, my, my wife's uh, love seat recliner whatever it is when I, when I lay down in my bed I can look and see how God provided for me all of this stuff. So when I ask the question, where does my stuff come from and where does your stuff come from? It comes from God. Listen to Solomon, the wisest man in the world. That's what he said in Ecclesiastes 3.13. He says, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy good of all the labor. And this is, let's, let's look what it says in your, in your Bible. It is the gift of God it is a gift of God you know I work I I earn a paycheck but you know what it's only by God's giving me the ability 
to work that I can earn a paycheck. And it's only by God's grace that I have the health that I have in order to earn uh, that paycheck. But really, even though I'm earning a paycheck and I'm able to buy stuff, still it's God's provision that brings that to me. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. You know, when we recognize where the blessings of God come from, then we are prepared to handle the responsibilities of stewardship. You need to understand, and I need to understand, that everything that we have comes from God. We may have to work to obtain it, but still, think about it. God gives us our health. God gives us our wealth. God gives us people uh, to, uh, to befriend. God gives us everything that we have. And so where do we get our stuff? We get it from God, and we need to recognize that fact. Then the second point, who holds us accountable for what we do with our stuff? Well, same answer as before. God does. God holds us account accountable. Listen to what it tells us in Romans chapter 14, verses 11 through 12. It says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Think about it. I remember when I was in high school, I was driving down an a, a, a old dirt road between Widefield and Security. I was, uh, it was my turn to go get gas for the church buses, and we had six of these uh, five-gallon cans that we would have to go fill up and then go and, and siphon into the buses because our church was out in the boonies, and a lot of people would drive out there and siphon the gas out of the buses. And so me and my dad, or actually my dad volunteered, and then Volan told me that this is what we were going to do. And I was flying down the road. I mean, I was booking it because I was tired. And, uh, uh, and I got pulled over. And as a result, I ended up going to court. And I had to stand before a judge. And I had to give an account of myself before the judge. Even though I didn't see a speed limit sign on that road. I would never seen a speed limit sign on that dirt road that cut between Widefield and Security. Nonetheless, it was there. And because it was there and it had a posted speed limit, I was held accountable. You know, everything that I do, I will be held accountable for before God. Now, we are told that we are, will be held accountable for our salvation. The Bible tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die... But after this, the judgment, one of these days, we will stand before a very holy God and give an account of ourselves uh, to God. Now, my account has been settled by the blood of Jesus Christ. But those who have not been, um, uh, have not come to Christ as a Lord and personal Savior, listen to what you have to look forward to. It tells us in verse number 11, and I saw uh, in, in Revelation chapter 20, starting verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, whose face um, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was none found. There was, there was, excuse me, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up their dead which were written therein, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were uh, in them and they were judged every man listen to this according to their works if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior you're going to be standing before a holy God one day giving yourself giving an account of yourself verse 14 says and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire you will be held responsible you will be held accountable I mean about whether or not you've accepted God's gracious gift of salvation. But after we're saved, we as Christians are held accountable for 
our obedience to God. That's what it tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey them which have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You know, I remember as a kid getting my report card. And sometimes I was very excited about going home to show my report card to my parents. And there were other days that I wasn't all that excited. Because I wasn't a very good steward of my time in school. And my grades weren't up to par and my behavior wasn't up to par. And I was about to be held accountable. It was there. You know what? God watches over us to see how obedient that we are to him. And as any loving father would do when we're misbehaving, sometimes God has to stop us in our tracks and get us set in the right way in that. We're held accountable for our obedience. And he also holds us accountable for what we say. Listen to the words of Matthew chapter 12. It says this, A good man out of a good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of an evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou, art, thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Can you imagine? I mean, sometimes we just get into be gossipy gus. Or we become disrespecting Daryl or whatever you want to put. Name there. And our idle words, God will hold us accountable for. Those are just a, just a few examples. You know, God wants us to straighten up and to fly right, as they say. So let's see what it means when it comes to stewardship. Let me ask you a question. Does God really care about what you do with his blessings? I'm not talking about just your money, but everything that we have. Does God really care? Well, I'm here to tell you yes. If you would, turn to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter number 3. Very famous uh, passage of scripture or used a lot of times, especially when you're talking about stewardship. It's still what the word of God says. It says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from me, excuse me, from mine ordinances, and have uh, not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say, wherein shall we return? And then he starts talking about the accountability uh, of our finances, of our money. But I want you to notice something. Is God unchanging? He is. He is unchanging. That's where the word of God tells us. So, does God really care about how we use our money? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, uh, do, does, did God see a problem with the way the Israelites were using the blessings uh, that he uh, gave to them in their lives, especially when it came to them giving of their tithes and offerings? Well, listen to what he says. These are his words, not mine. He says, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. He's talking to the Israelites. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? Then he tells us, in tithes and in offerings. In tithes and in offerings. Now, what reasons could God have for making such a harsh uh, accusation? Well, let's look what it says. It says, ye have robbed me. Ye have robbed me. Look at verse number 9. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me uh, now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open uh, you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be room enough, uh, excuse me, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, what was God angry about? Well, some people were just not paying their tithes and offerings. They weren't giving back to the Lord. Now, they knew in, their, in, in the Old Testament law and the things that God had set down uh, for them that they were to give a tenth of all their first fruits uh, to God. They, they knew that. 
a tenth of, uh, of their crops, a tenth of their, uh, of their uh, cattle, a tenth of everything that they had went to the Lord. For us, you know, we, have, we earn money. And, uh, and so a tenth of that uh, goes to the Lord. So some people were just not paying their tithes and offerings. Still others were withholding uh, part of their tithe and offering because they were in hard times. Hard times were upon them. Well, here in May of 2020, you know what? There's some hard times on a lot of people. And a lot of times when, when, when we're looking at our bills and we're looking at our bank account and we still need to pay our tithe, we're thinking, well, you know what? I can jip God this time. No. It says the first fruits. You know, when we get our paycheck, the first thing that we should do is to give back to God. It's to give back to God. People weren't doing that. And still others were not paying their tithe to the proper place. God said uh, that they were to bring it into the storehouse. What is the storehouse these days? It's a local church. It's a church that you belong to. You know what? There's some other folks that are out there. There are some good charities and stuff that, that, that need our support. But you know what? They don't need our tithe. They don't need our offering. We need to, to make sure that we're giving God the first of everything uh, like we're supposed to. Now, let me ask you another question. Uh, why should they or we be concerned about paying our tithes and our offerings? Let me tell you this. The payment of the tithe and the offerings is a recognition of our subjection to God and a recognition that God owns us and all that we have. He told them that they needed to be bringing that in. And by them not paying, by them withholding uh, their tithe, they were renouncing the very sovereignty of God. They were re renouncing, not his sovereignty, the sovereignty authority that God had uh, over them. They were as guilty, listen to this, listen to me. That's what God tells us. They were as guilty as Lucifer was when he had not respect for God's authority. A failure to recognize God's uh, sovereignty uh, is, a, uh, is, is for us to reject him. It's for us to reject him. It's important that we obey God in giving of our tithes and our offerings. And that's part of stewardship. We talked about time and talent last week. But today we're talking about, and people say, hey, you can have my time and my talent, but boy, uh, leave my pocketbook alone. Leave my wallet alone. Uh, I'm not the one picking on you. I'm just a messenger. The Word of God tells us. God was saying to them, just like he says us today, are you going to rob me? Are you going to rob me? I mean, I, I've sat there before with check in hand, thinking, Man, I really need this, or my money would be much better spent this way. No. We need to obey God because obedience brings blessing. So let's break it down just a little bit further. What is a tithe and what is an offering? Well, a tithe uh, literally means tenth, tenth or ten percent. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30 these words. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, listen to what it says, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now remember, when the children of Israel were going into Jericho, God said, this is consecrated to me. This will be an accursing. This is going to be dedicated to me. It belongs to me. Why? Because this was the first of many cities that God was going to bring them into land. Remember when God promised them the land? He said, you know what? I'm going to give you a land that has just got all kinds of crops. It's flowing with milk and honey. There are going to be homes. There are going to be cities. There are going to be all kinds of these things that I'm just going to turn on over to you as you go into the land. And if they would have been obedient, completely obedient, they would have been had everything completely provided for. Remember, these people that were coming across the desert, these were all former slaves in Egypt for 
450 years their ancestors had been enslaved. These are the ones that were about to be blessed by getting to go into the promised land, by receiving that promise, finally, of having their own land, their own place that is there. And after they got into the land, they they started to forget about the blessings of God. Boy, we can't forget about those blessings of God. Man, right off the, the right off the top of everything that we have, ten percent of that belongs to God. And then, uh, when when Malachi was writing, it says, "Ye have law, through God, God said to him, uh, through him, ye have robbed me in tithes, but not just tithes, but in offerings as well." So, what's an offering? An offering is a present. It's a sacrifice or it's a tribute. It's a gift. It's anything that is above the tithe. Now, I need to pay my tithe. And I need to give offerings. But that's where God allows me to decide what what that's going to be. How I can be a blessing. You know, we have several different projects going on around the church. We've been trying to get the, the, the entire parking lot paid. You know what? I don't give my tithe in order for the parking lot to be paid. I'm giving my tithe in order to take care of the church. But I give an offering. Or we take offerings to help pay for us to do that or for some other things. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. But when it comes to offerings, listen to what it tells us in Psalm chapter 96, verse 8. It says, "Give unto the Lord the um, it says, give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering, and come into His courts." So, what are our tithes and offerings used for? Okay, well, number one, our tithes help pay our utility bills, keeps the power on, keeps us warm in the winter, cool in the summer, helps us uh, to have the furniture, helps us to have the instrumentation, helps us to have the songbooks, helps to have all the different things. Uh, that we have uh, here inside the building of our church. Help us to pay our mortgage. Helps us to pay our taxes. Helps us to do all of the different things that we are supposed to uh, do here at church. Uh, Our tithe also equips uh, the church for uh, for service. There are things that we need. Inside the church there are many bathrooms. And those bathrooms need supplies because people uh, need to use those while they're here. And uh, because of this COVID thing that we're in now, uh, we've uh, put up more uh, hand sanitizing machines so that everywhere you go, there are uh, sanitizing machines in order for you to uh, uh, get your hands clean. And so we need to make sure that, that, uh, that we can uh, uh, put those things uh, into play. But once we start having services again here in the auditorium, uh, between services, we'll need to sanitize everything. That's going to to cost money, but that's what uh, our tithes go to. Our tithes also go to uh, pay for uh, the the salaries uh, that we have for the different staff members. Uh, Our church uh, currently has uh, three full-time staff members. Plus, then we uh, we hire a janitorial staff uh, on top of that, people to come in and clean the building. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, we're very blessed in order to have... Uh, staff members at our church but uh, let's say that something was to happen and uh, you had a family member who had been rushed to the hospital and you called the, to the church for the pastor but there was nobody here to answer the phone because we couldn't afford people weren't giving their ties so we couldn't afford to have uh, Miss Tanya here as a secretary to get a hold of me or brother James or let's say that uh, you try to call my cell phone and say, Pastor, you need to come right away. And I'll tell you, well, I'm sorry. I don't get off of work until uh, 5 o'clock because I have to be a vocational, bivocational pastor and I have a job somewhere uh, and, uh, in order to, to feed my family, to take care of my, my wife and I. You know, it's important for us to pay our tithes because it helps us to have full-time staff members, people that can, can, can give a concentrated uh, effort into helping to take care of people, visiting people, and taking care of things. But that's what tithes do. So what do offerings do? Well, offerings help to make a difference in the ministries of the church. One of the biggest offerings that we have is known as Faith Promise Missions. Getting ready to have our Faith Promise Conference here in just a couple of weeks. 
where we will come together and hear about missions and, and be charged up for that. And then hopefully you've already been praying about what God would have you to do this year in giving a, a special offering, it, whether it's once a week or once a month or once a year or however you uh, the Lord leads on you. But we have several missionaries that we need to take care of. And we do that through pay, Faith Promise Missions. We don't take a part of our tithe to do missions. This is all by offering that, that we give that uh, to them. And then sometimes uh, uh, when we have special guests or special speakers in, especially when it comes to revival time, we take up a special offering. Uh, it's above the tithe. And it's above our regular offerings we give to church in order to give a love offering to the man of God uh, that has come to, uh, uh, to preach the word to us uh, in that. So uh, offerings are something that's above our tithe. And just these two areas that we talked about uh, help us to make a difference. Well, I challenge you next time you're, you're, you're able to come into the church building, go over by where the restrooms are between the, uh, right as you're exiting the, the, the A wing, going into the B wing down the ramp. And take a look at the missions letters that we have out there. Boy, if you were to, to, to map that out, and we've had somebody do that, you would notice that the sun never sets on the ministry of Cornerstone Baptist Church. We support missions all around the world. And as some of us are, are, are getting up, there are some missionaries that are getting ready to go to bed, and they've had a full day of service. And as we do our service here, there are some that are, that are just beginning there, some that are just ending there, and so in that. So it's important for us uh, to do that. So how does God challenge us then concerning giving? Well, first of all, God tells us to bring it. He tells us to bring it. And what did it say in verse 10? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. He says, don't, 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 don't be skimpy. Don't, don't skip out on it, but bring you all the tithe into the storehouse we need to bring it and when we bring it it will help to provide for the needs of the church but then God will do his part look at verse number 10 uh, it says uh, this it says bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that so there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a what? What does it say there? That's right. It says blessing. A blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God says bring it. You bring it and he'll bless it. He will bless uh, the giving, uh, uh, our giving in abundance. You know, it, it amazes me what God can do through the people of Cornerstone Baptist Church. It amazes me the amount of missionaries that we're able to support and keep on the field. But you know what? There are other missionaries that are itching to get to the field. There are other missionaries that God has called that if, if we were just a little bit more faithful in giving in of, of our offerings, that we could take on one or two more missionaries this year uh, to be able to help them to get to the field uh, to tell folks about Jesus Christ. And uh, not only that, but, uh, but also in helping others. Uh, because there's going to be a lot of folks. Boy, we, th this COVID thing has really hurt a lot of business, a lot of people. And there are just some folks that, that, that are going to need some help. And they'll turn to the church. And uh, for that, it'd be a blessing if we could help them. Just remember this. Every time that you give tithes or offerings, you are investing in others. You're investing in others. Now, years ago, the Salvation Army was holding their international convention uh, and their founder, General William Booth, was not able to attend because of um, just physical weakness from illness. He cabled his convention message to them and it was just one word and that word was others, others. You know, it's important for us. Yes, God will bless us for tithing. God will bless us because we're being obedient to him. And God blesses in many different ways. Think about the children of Israel. The Bible says that their clothes and their shoes never wore out the whole 40 years that they're walking around the wilderness. God just preserved that. I mean, think about some of the cars that you've owned, how long they've been on the road. Or think about, uh, like for us in our house, 
Uh, we lived in our house for uh, 25 years before uh, we had to replace our water heater, and it hadn't even gone bad yet. It was just slowing down a bit, and we were going to have some uh, part of our family move in with us, so we decided to go ahead and get a new one. But think of the things that God just puts a little bit more longevity on. You know, it's not always necessarily the, 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 the dinero or money. Sometimes God just blesses with us in different ways, and God will bring that blessing. Now, Achan's sin affected more than just him. It affected his family. It affected his tribe, his nation. God uh, could not and would not bless the nation until Achan and all that he had was destroyed. I wonder sometimes how many blessings, how many blessings I have cost my family and my church and my nation because of my disobedience. Not just in this area, but in er other areas as well. I'm asking you to do this for me tonight. Take an inventory of yourself. Are you stealing from God? You can't call me a thief. I'm not calling you a thief. I'm just asking you. When it comes to tithing, when it comes to giving your offerings, are you stealing from God? Because if you're stealing from God, then you're robbing blessings from your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. You're robbing blessings from your family. You're robbing blessings from your church. You're robbing blessings from the church people. Let's take an inventory of ourselves. Ask yourself, does God get the first fruits of my time and of my talents and of my treasure? If not, then we have to admit that we're in sin. Let me ask you a question. How does your heart check out tonight? Do you? Do you have some of God's stuff among your stuff? If so, give it back to him. Give it back to him. And take his challenge and see if God won't bless you for obedience. It's important for us to be obedient. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we can gather around your word. Lord, I know that this was kind of a tough message, but Lord, I pray that you would just help us to receive it, Lord, in the way that it was presented, Lord, and that's with love. Not, I wasn't accusing anybody of anything, Lord, honest in my heart, you know that. But God, I know, I just know that we could do more, that we could do better as a church. And I just pray, God, that you would just help me, help me to be the leader that I need to be in showing, Lord, how to give our time and our, and our talent and our treasure and our testimony back to you. I thank you, Lord, for the time we can gather around your word. Pray, Lord, you're just blessed now. Bless on our services as well for the rest of the week. We ask your precious name.